welcome to the state of the future. We will soon start at 100 million securities and derivative transactions a year, navigating millions of legal and technical requirements through years of experience and vast amounts of data. We arrive at software solutions and services at highest quality levels, exceeding the industry standard by a factor of five, all to finally zero in on a single personal customer need, yours. Finding the hole in the detail and vice versa. This way we create the state of the future, setting digital standards for years to come. Thank you very much to everyone for joining this discussion. We have a 45-minute panel ahead of us. Our topic is withholding tax across Europe. Let me briefly introduce our four panelists. Not with us yet, uh, but uh, hopefully coming is Katja Pusila of the Finnish Tax Administration. She is in charge of the implementation of the TRACE initiative in Finland. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Uh, Mertesdorf Piratona of Franklin Templeton in Luxembourg. Uh, I don't think I need to introduce Franklin Templeton. Uh, Ms. Uh, Mertesdorf is head of tax in that um, asset management house. Uh, Mr. Siedelmeier of the BVE in uh, Frankfurt um, is uh, the BVE is the German Industry Association of approximately 80 regulated uh, German asset managers. And last but not least, Mr. Wolfgang Grüb of SDS in Vienna. And SDS is a software and services firm with 250 experts and um, deploying software solutions and services to the financial services industry, especially in the area of securities processing and also engaged with the TRACE initiative in Finland. Thank you very much, Mr. Grüb. Thank you very much for all of you that you are joining here and um, helping us with, uh, with this topic. A brief introduction, please. Um, please allow me to quote a recent statement of the World Trade Organization. Uh, I quote, the financial services sector plays a critical role in any modern economy. The bundle of institutions and services that make up an economy, economy's financial system can be seen as the brain of the economy, providing the bulk of the economy's need for many functions. Now, what is the raw material, the resource, the raw material of uh, this economy, the financial services uh, sector and the economy? What is this? its lifeblood, so to speak, if you allow me to use a picture here? The raw material of the financial services industry is capital. Uh, no financial services industry and probably no modern economy without capital. Capital in the form of debt assets or equity assets. And this capital does not sit idly somewhere in a pocket, hopefully. And um, instead, the capital is moving around in the search for safety and yield. Uh, for example, moving between asset classes and moving between jurisdictions. Now, of these asset classes, probably the equity investment is of special importance. Um, equity is different than debt um, within the context of an economy and also due to the sheer size of such investments. For example, such investments by investment funds and other collective investment schemes or vehicles. And so that's the frame for the importance in the end of capital and for the free movement of capital, one of the fundamental rights of the European Union, and the importance for the economy as a whole and especially for the financial services industry and its customers. In this larger field, equity investments, withholding tax, the free movement of capital, um, what is the tax law of the future in this field? What does this mean in the economically important field of withholding tax across Europe? So where is the tax environment heading in this, um, in this area? 
Um, Ms. Matistov, maybe the two of us can start the discussion. Um, uh, what current trends do you, does F uh, Franklin Templeton, uh, observe in recent cases of the European Court of Justice uh, related to the free movement of capital? Maybe is there a trend towards the return of the nation state in EU tax law and its court decisions? Um, and uh, there are some recent decisions that may be interesting in this context to set the stage from this perspective. Maybe, um, do you have a few thoughts on this, maybe? Yeah, I would probably not yet talk about a return to the nation state uh, principle, but there have definitely been some difficult or more concerning developments in, in relation to withholding tax matters specifically for, for the investment fund industry recently. So on the one hand, I would say um, there's Denmark and there's the Netherlands where the European Court of Justice issued decisions that are to some extent at least favorable for foreign investment funds, but where then the local courts have taken an interpretation or an approach that led to, to a dead end more or less um, uh, for most of the reclaims for the funds um, um, at the moment. And then on the other hand, as you have just alluded to, there is a pending ECJ case uh, in relation to Portuguese withholding tax at the moment. Um, this is a case of a German investment fund. Um, the case is called AEVN. And there the Advocate General, Mrs. Uh, Juliana Cocot, delivered in, in the summer her opinion, which is yeah, somehow problematic and, and contains a few um, surprising statements. Um, if you permit, I would give a little bit of background about this, this case before talking maybe about um, yeah, the opinion of Mrs. Cocot. So um, as I already mentioned, the case concerns a, a German regulated investment fund that received dividend from Portuguese companies in I think 2015 and 2016. And those uh, dividends were subject to Portuguese withholding tax of 25%, um, lowered based on the double tax treaty to 15%. Um, in theory, I think uh, foreign funds can be exempt from that Portuguese withholding tax, but only if they are subject to corporate income tax in their um, country of residency. And in the, the years in question, the German funds were not yet subject to corporate income tax in Germany, therefore they were not exempt in, in Portugal. Um, the local Portuguese funds were, however, exempt uh, from corporate income tax or withholding tax on those Portuguese dividends, because in the Portuguese tax system, the taxation is supposed to place, uh, take place on the investor level. Um, Portuguese funds are then, however, subject to some level of tax. It's um, stamp duty or um, yeah, like the subscription tax that uh, most people might know from Luxembourg. So it's um, um, tax on the net assets of the funds. And I think the rate was uh, 1.25 basis points. And then the, the German, uh, German fund was, was claiming in the court case that the Portuguese withholding tax system was uh, discriminating foreign funds because they suffered that uh, withholding tax of 25% um, and, and uh, Portuguese uh, funds were exempt from that. Um, yeah, and without going into all the details of the Advocates General uh, opinion, I would like to highlight um, the few key statements that um, are concerning for, for us, so I, I think for, for the industry in general. Um, the first one is that Mrs. Cocotte was seeing a relationship between that stamp duty and the corporate income tax or the withholding tax on, on dividend, although the stamp duty is a completely different levy, it has a different tax base. Um, um, yeah, there is no clear relationship, I, I think, to the dividend income. Um, the Advocate General sees the two as somehow related and, and therefore argues that um, the Portuguese funds are not tax exempt. They are just taxed based on a different method or a different taxation technique. 
And then um, she's stating that in, in case of such different taxation techniques, um, there can only be a restriction of the free movement of capital if the taxation technique applied to the non-resident funds is less favorable. Then to determine whether or not the tax treatment is less favorable, she's coming up with a second surprising um, statement, I think. Um, so she's saying um, that one has to look jointly at the fund level and the investor level. And as the German fund in, in the past um, was subject to a tax system, a transparent tax system where they could pass on withholding tax credits to the investor level, uh, Mrs. Cocotte was of the opinion that this was compensating the disadvantage incurred at the fund level. That seems to me um, like quite a new approach. Um, I think the ECJ stated in several other cases that fund and investor level should be looked at separately and the uh, investor level should be disregarded um, for determining if the, the fund is suffering an unequal tax treatment. And maybe just one remark at that respect. It assumes that all of the investors of the German funds are Germans which in, a, in an international asset management world is not necessarily, it may often be the case, but it's not necessarily justified. Hello, Ms. Pusila, we now see you. Okay, please go on. Yeah, but uh, that's a very good point. Like um, um, our um, company, um, we have our European hub in Luxembourg. Um, so in, in Luxembourg, um, there are, of course, investors from, from the entire world. Uh, Luxembourg doesn't apply any, any tax to them. Um, and so investors are taxed according to, I don't know, German, French, UK, US, whatsoever law. So it's not even possible um, to determine what the tax treatment um, on the investor level is. But here in, in the case of the German fund, I, I think um, the majority of the investors were probably German funds. So in a nutshell, uh, it seems to me, Ms. Mertesdorf, that, uh, uh, that uh, the Attorney General tries to roll back uh, a long-standing tradition of court decisions of the European Court of Justice. And I think, interestingly, she also says that the uh, fundamental right of the free movement of capital is of a lesser nature than the other three fundamental uh, uh, freedoms uh, of the European Union. Huh? Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that is the third uh, really concerning statement in, in her opinion. Um, as you said, she believes that um, the free movement of capital gives a lower level of protection than, than the other fundamental freedoms. Um, I think she's saying it only protects against arbitrary discrimination <laughs> compared to normal discrimination um, for the other freedoms. And um, yeah, I've certainly not read every piece of literature on, on uh, European law and also not read every ECJ case, but um, I've been involved in a lot. So I've not, not really seen that um, ECJ case law in the past um, restricted the free movement of capital in, in that way and somehow saw it as subordinate um, to the other uh, freedom. So, um, quite an interesting thesis um, uh, here in that opinion. Uh, I, I, I have just seen, Ms. Matisdorf, a statement by a different Attorney General at the European Court of Justice related to a Finnish case. And if one reads this statement, uh, it is quite uh, different than the European, than the AG Kokot statement. So it seems that within the European Court, they are just only the Attorney Generals. There is no clear cut methodology and, and, and these two, at least these two opinions, and they are very recent opinions, are following a completely different line. So maybe we could ask the German uh, tax, uh, um, or excuse me, Mr. Zielemeyer, your personal thoughts on this uh, from, of course, a bit of the perspective of the German fund industry. If we now see these different uh, statements um, uh, on the tax legal level, um, what are your thoughts about this development and maybe what would be the consequences if the uh, 
um, opinion of uh, Ms. Kokot that Ms. Zinnemeyer and all Ms. Mattisdorf just described uh, would come through. And maybe you have a few numbers. How much are we talking about here by sheer numbers and, and volume of money? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Grutzmann. Um, first of all, I would like to confirm what uh, Judith Mattisdorf said. Uh, it was also very surprising for us, this opinion of the Advocate General with the ECG. Because let's say, if you remind the uh, uh, case law uh, with respect to investment funds, we have uh, seen, for example, the Santander case against France, and we have seen the Köln Aktienfonds case against the Netherlands. And there are always the ECT stated that, let's say, the uh, domestic and the foreign fund must be treated equally. And for example, in France, the tax exemption of the French fund was not, let's say, related to any issues on the investor level. And in the Netherlands, uh, the ECG stated that, okay, if the, the uh, tax exemption of the Dutch funds uh, relates to certain conditions, then the uh, conditions must be met for the uh, foreign fund as well. And now this new opinion would be a completely contradictory to that what uh, was stated in the past. And let's say, I think, that uh, there's also one point missing in the thoughts. So one is the, the, the legal uh, questions we, we could discuss, but the others that are the factual discussions we have to uh, take into account. If you imagine, for example, for the German industry, we have, let's say, the half of the German funds are retail investment funds. They are uh, open-ended funds. Uh, they have an uh, always changing investor base. And, and the other uh, half uh, are institutional funds where maybe the investors are known. But in the retail fund sector, due to the fact that the funds are open-ended, in Germany, for example, where the funds traditionally issue bearer shares, uh, they issue a so-called global certificate, which is uh, stored with a central securities depositor. And the fund units, they are in custody with so-called account holder banks. So the investors of the funds are the customer of those banks. Now this means that the investors are not known for the investment funds in this respect. So and if it now depends on whether the withholding tax is refunded, uh, whether the investor can credit the foreign withholding tax or not, this may be, let's say, a legal aspect to consider, but in theory, in fact, this will be not able to be proven in practice. So, of course, then for the retail fund, it would be very, very hard, let's say, to argue for uh, the refunds. And in the uh, institutional sector, of course, if you are uh, able to identify the investors, then it may be easier. But let's say for all that kind of funds that have, for example, uh, uh, taxable investors that they can credit, uh, then, okay, uh, the game would be over. So you, you asked me also about, let's say, the volume which is behind that. Maybe I do not have actual figures, but what is kind of interesting is when we started thinking about claiming uh, the foreign withholding tax, we started with the uh, um, countries France, the Netherlands and Norway back in 2006. And when we, we, we started these claims, uh, we thought about, well, is it worse to make a kind of a test claim in order to see uh, what happens uh, with all these claims? The test claims, they ended in the Santander and in the current Aktien from Deka case. And for that reason, we made a survey what kind of amounts have been claimed. Only for two calendar years uh, in France, Netherlands and Norway. And we came up to an amount of approximately 1 billion euros only for these three countries for two calendars. So everybody can imagine what it means if the funds claim, let's say, across Europe and for a decade, for, for example. So uh, if now the uh, ECG, let's say, would uh, make a contradictory decisions uh, than that in the past. Uh, everybody can imagine what this means for the claims for the funds. And, uh, and in 2006, we still had a lot of yield on bonds, uh, uh, which nowadays and, and for a number of years does not exist. So that probably 
the equity investment have not decreased since then. So probably the amounts are much higher, especially. Absolutely, absolutely correct. Yeah. If we are looking at more than those three uh, jurisdictions. Um, okay. And if I, if I could just add, if, <laughs> sorry, for, for the non-German industry, they still have all those German claims outstanding, which, which are substantial, and those um, claims have not um, yet be, been decided by the ECJ. So uh, what, what we are really concerned about is if there is a change in paradigm now in, in uh, the ECJ, um, what does that mean um, to the German claims? Yes. Okay, thank you very much uh, to the two of you for the time being. Uh, Mr. Gub, uh, to come to you, and unfortunately, your, so to speak, sparring partner, Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Pusila, I, I regret this very much, is not here yet. Uh, but um, uh, so I may introduce uh, this topic with a bit of a, uh, of a few words on the trace initiative of the OECD. Uh, maybe not everyone knows it yet. Uh, so um, in 2006 already, the OECD started uh, the TRACE initiative. What does TRACE stand for? Treaty, Relief and Compliance Enhancement. Uh, the two objectives of this initiative of the OECD are to develop efficient treaty relief systems, um, including to minimize and allocate appropriately the administrative costs of reclaiming under double tax treaties and to identify solutions that enhance the ability of both source and investor resident countries to ensure proper compliance with tax obligations under the treaties. And this mandate included the two following aspects, which are interesting here for our audience and, and, and collective investment schemes. Uh, so the two the two aspects were included in the mandate of the of the initiative legal and policy issues relating to the extent to which either collective investment vehicles or their investors are entitled to treaty benefits and procedural aspects uh, regarding claims for reduction of withholding tax in source countries for provided for by treaty double tax treaty when assets are held indirectly whether through uh, collective investment schemes or through nominees and custodians. So that is quite a challenge to achieve. And um, uh, Finland is the front runner here in the European Union of installing uh, this initiative. And um, uh, uh, Ms. Pusila could, um, I see at least a, a dark screen now. Ms. Pusila, can we hear you maybe? No, nope, I'm sorry. I have to take this part then. Um, please excuse me. Uh, Ms. Pusina introduced us to a number of the details, which I cannot repeat. But in the end, the main question here is that um, uh, this digitalization could indeed give us an indication of what the future of the withholding tax across Europe could mean. And if installed, uh, and Mr. Goeb can help us with, uh, with these aspects, because it's not so easy, as uh, Mr. Zinemeyer Mr. also just uh, noted, um, uh, uh, in case of funds, uh, and if uh, installed, and if the technicalities have overcome, of course, such a system could uh, make it much quicker and easier and more efficient to reclaim withholding tax suffered on, for example, dividend income. Mr. Gerb, what is your what was your part in the Trace Initiative and its implementation in Finland, or as implemented in Finland? The, the part where we come uh, as a long-standing software vendor to uh, the securities industry and in particular the back office industry is mainly automation. So. Uh, first, you start with the easy thing, you automate the trading, then you do the less so easy things like settlement, corporate actions, income processing, and so on. And we all probably know about the Giovannini barriers, which have been named like 20 years ago, and some of them are still around. And actually, withholding, uh, foreign withholding tax is one of these problems which has long refused any attempt to automate it like you could automate trading or settlement processes uh, or reporting processes. Why is that the case? Uh, and this is actually where Trace comes in and Trace sounds like a simple solution to, uh, uh, to, to this problem. Uh, in its details, it is not, but the problem is surprisingly simple. 
the problem or the, or the idea is it's surprisingly simple. Today, when someone pays to a non-domestic investor, uh, typically the paying agent, the withholding agent will withhold on, uh, on a very high level, 25, 27, 30, 35 percent, whatsoever is in the regulations, just to make sure that at least someone puts a tax on that payment on course. Now, what we all have been discussing is the question how and when and under which circumstances, if I'm obliged to, uh, to uh, have a tax reduction on this because I'm paying taxes at home anyway, how do I get the money back? And typically you go this very long and very expensive uh, way of uh, a reclaim. But basically the investor or the intermediary needs to, uh, to, uh, to make plausible to the, uh, to the tax authority of the source country that uh, he's entitled to reclaim and a lesser rate. Um, now, the, the, the idea to solve that problem is, what if at the time of the payment, somehow I could tell upfront to the paying agent what my tax rate would be? And this paying agent has good reason to believe me, and that's the difficult point. Then the paying agent just could deduct less, give me more money. I just get what I'm entitled to. I pay my other. Okay, there's no great the solution. Yeah, that's how trades should work. Now the big problem is. How do you get this information to the paying agent and to the withholding agent? Uh, no one wants to pass this up the, uh, the, the custody chain. And the fund industry in particular, as Holger Sedlmeier laid out, uh, is in a horrible situation in many cases of not even knowing about the, um, about the tax status of their end investors because it doesn't sit with them. It sits with the uh, or it sits with the retail banks who are holding the accounts for them, and uh, that's the difficult problem. So how could I convey that back? And this is where Trace comes in, and this is where Trace offers a solution to I think at least part of the problems. So I think it will work very fine with someone who is directly investing, and it has its difficulties when it uh, when the investment is done via a fund. Uh, but the basic idea is that each and every so-called uh, so auto, uh, authorized intermediary, similar like in the QI regime, is collecting information about the tax status. The, the intermediary needs to make that transparent to the authorities, to their own authorities and to the non-domestic authorities in the source country. And then they will, they will put this in a pool, this information, and only give a pooled information up the custody chain to their custodians. The custodians in turn can trust the authorized intermediary because they know it is authorized. They are authorized to do this uh, as well. And so you effectively, you, pu you push the information to the paying agent and the paying agent can deduct the right amount and it goes back and the local tax is collected and that's it and everyone's fine and the reclaim process does not need to take place. Um, uh, that's the reason why we actually, as a software vendor, did step into this place for the first time. Uh, withholding has been done for a long time, but it's so cumbersome and so complex, and it requires so much individual knowledge about each and every case that there is no way to automate it currently. So it's nothing where we said that's, that's, that's worth writing software. And now with Trace, at least for some of the cases, this could work much better. It's like building a railway. So you need a lot of engineers to build it. That's where the smart thinking, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the lawyers, the regulators go in, then you design it, but then the trains can run more or less automatically in a modern train system. And Trace probably for part of this is a solution to this instead of carrying each and, uh, and every reclaim uh, in this manual way. And that's the reason why we actually stepped in and said, okay, now with Trace, at least for some investors, it may be worse going the way of, tra of Trace. What do you do with Trace? As an investor, you uh, open the, you, you have your account with an authorized intermediary. 
you uh, the intermediary in turn makes a contract with the source country's authority. That's uh, where Katapusila would come in and tell us much more about this. That's so to say her role in the game. And uh, then uh, two things happen. One is uh, that the reduced tax is paid, and the other thing is that by the years and a reporting takes place where the authorized intermediary hands over all the information about the receiving parties, tax numbers, name, addresses, tax status, and so on, for the source country's authorities to check on this. So it's not blind trust, it also does the checking, but it is done on an automated level, on a prearranged level, data is already collected by the authorized intermediaries. So a lot of work goes to the level of the KYC process in the individual banks, and then they are able to participate in, uh, in that process. And that's the point where we said, okay, this is something where it's worth uh, building some automating software for this, go beyond some extra sheets, paperwork, and so on. And uh, as we all know, uh, Trace with uh, Finland is currently in its, uh, uh, in its uh, native cycle. So the withholding is already done on reduced rates. And uh, I think Katja Pusula can hear us right now, at least. And the, uh, what we have done so far together with one client of us is to test submit the reporting files and uh, to check whether this will work. The reporting is due in January, so January next year. There's not a lot of time to do anymore. So we have already done the, let's say, simple cases of submitting uh, a test, submitting a file, getting a return. Now we need to work on the more complex cases like amendments and corrections to that files and so on and so on. But it's a very, very interesting field and I'm really curious to see if and how this will evolve. I, I totally agree with the industry that this is fine for an individual investor, an institutional investor going that way. We still need to uh, to save uh, the, uh, we still need to solve the problems for the fund industry, but probably Katya can tell us something more about this. I think the connection works now. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Gub, for this introduction. And definitely, uh, this is uh, from a software perspective. In the end, it's not rocket science, but it needs a lot of preparation. And and a single point of truth with regard to data is definitely helpful across such a chain of institutions that are involved. Um, Ms. Pusila, can you hear us? Yes, loud and clear. And apologies for the issues. Uh our building's Wi-Fi completely crashed, which, which is very fun when you are attending a meeting like this. But yeah, I can hear you. Okay, we started. <laughs> and um, uh, and Ms. Pusula, as we had discussed in the beginning, we set the scene a bit with uh, the European Court of Justice and its tax legal decisions and the conflicts going on there. Mr. Uh, Mr. Group just informed us a bit about the technicalities of installing in a system across a chain of service providers which all have data points and maybe data breaks. And um, so maybe from the Finnish perspective, now you are here the front runner in, um, in uh, introducing into practice the trace system, which I, uh, um, I introduced the audience about the, the background of this of the system and what is is the purpose um, um what from your finnish perspective what were the challenges what are the benefits um could you help us a bit on this topic yeah uh, gladly um well if, if, we, if we start with the benefits i think the obvious benefit is the standardized procedure and and as a standardized procedure i mean the standardized uh, investor self-declaration procedure, the standardized authorized intermediary model, and also the standardized XML trace reporting schema. These are very important elements for tax administrations as well, because we already had uh, a relief at source system previously in Finland, and the issue was that it was very difficult to kind of like um, give guidance on very national-based system in a way 
that all the parties that and all the stakeholders abroad would understand. And we had issues with the previous system. And when we started to remodel the system, we kind of like thought that, OK, the option is to uh, do a completely national model or we could go into trace, which is a standardized, well known model, even though no one has implemented before, it has very much uh, alike with the QI system and it has been co-drafted with the with the OECD and the industry so it, it's familiar at least uh, to some extent to the industry as well and so it was very easy decision in a way to decide that the trace is the way to go we wanted to be for, forward minded and we wanted to make sure that we would reach a certain level of compliance uh, even uh, even if uh, the intermediary wouldn't have read our specific guidance, they would, they would, uh, we would receive a certain level of compliance even with uh, someone who has just read the implementation package. So that was kind of the background. And the other other one is the investor self declaration procedure. I think that's very important. I think we've been way too much focusing on certificate of residence. Uh, and I think the investor self-declaration procedure actually provides uh, better uh, quality of information to the tax administrations as well. Um, we try to uh, implement the trace uh, as far as possible as such, um, but we did modernize it a bit. Uh, uh, we, for example, allow completely electronic investor self-declaration procedure, so we kind of had this kind of like digitalization and uh, kind of like digital future in mind uh, when drafting the guidance. So we allow a completely electronic process. And I think that's uh, what the future it should be at least, uh, that we allow digital solutions uh, also for identifying the beneficial owners. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kutia. Did you, did you in, in Finland, when thinking about implementing this system, uh, did you take note of, of the collective investment schemes, which make up a large, a large amount of the equity investments within the EU? Or is this the starting point, maybe, of your, um, of your implementation more seen from the perspective of a direct investor, let's say a German or a Swedish person holding Finnish shares, or did you find um, any complications there? Yeah, we did discuss about collective investment vehicles, and we very quickly noted that in order to resolve the withholding tax issue that the CIVs are facing, we need other countries uh, to get on board as well. Um, so I think uh, the way I see it is, is, is that this is a starting point. And I think uh, it's, it's very good when we kind of like have the basis level of, of uh, implementation, we can then go forward with, with all other initiatives. Uh, like, like the civil model that the trace provides actually requires other countries to get involved as well. Uh, it would require probably uh, changes in the treaties, which no country can do on their own. So I think all eyes are on the EU Commission right now. And I personally, I hope that we are going to see, uh, if not trace, but at least some elements of trace uh, in the EU level. And I think that would be a very good next step. Uh, in order to resolve the withholding tax issue for collective investment vehicles. And I cannot stress enough that it, that is an issue for the tax administrations as well. So I think it's in, in mutual benefit, uh, not only for the industry, but also for the tax administrations to be able to solve the withholding tax challenge that the collective investment vehicles are facing. Yes. Thank you very much, Ms. Pusila. We have five minutes to go, and originally we had thought to start a wild discussion now. I don't think we will have the time, but I would like uh, each of you for a brief statement uh, uh, towards the end, because we only have five minutes. Before we do so, um, before uh, you maybe uh, finish the session with your uh, statement, I would like to quickly comment on a few questions that I see 
they are being raised by the audience here. And for example, I see what are, is the future of text in, in digital assets. That is another session later, I think either today or tomorrow, sorry, but that is a, spe a special session of our event here of uh, Hansukas FSTC uh, <coughs> conference. So I can only say that I believe that digitalization in the field of withholding tax is a must and it is possible. Everything the financial, many things the financial services industry does is related to data. What is money in this industry? What are securities? In the end, it's all reflected by our data. So it should be possible to digitalize here. Although I fully agree with Mr. Goop, this is not a, sim a simple uh, task. There are other questions like um, uh, a beneficial ownership problem. We try to tackle this. Uh, Finland and others are only at the start. How far do you look through a transparent vehicle? It's not so easy. And also at what point in time and what do you need as, as proof that somebody has really suffered the withholding tax? Uh, securities lent out by a fund are an easy uh, topic uh, to, to, to see the problem here. Uh, I see the question, uh, what is the discriminatory taxation of pension funds versus usage funds? Well, they are both called funds, but in the end they are completely different vehicles, although both are asset management, asset collecting vehicles. There are some similarities. What we cannot go into this, I like this question, maybe we should do an expert session on this. And I also see a question in COMEX and COMCOM, and I would like to say this is, uh, first from my perspective, COMEX is completely different than COMCOM, totally different things, although they have comparable names. And we are here in the regulated fund world, and COMEX was not played these, uh, let's call them games, although I know it's a euphemism. Uh, were not played by regulated funds. That is, uh, that where they were criminals. Uh, and in my view, sorry, uh, that's um, that's also a different uh, question. So that much for the audience. We have two minutes left. That's about thirty minutes for each of you. Ms. Natisdorf, Ms. Gusila. I don't know um, who would like to start with a final statement. Maybe Ms. Natisdorf. Yeah, maybe my, my final statement would be that uh, for, for the asset management industry or the, the fund management industry, withholding tax matters uh, continue to be a very challenging um, topic, taking a lot of attention in it. Uh, yeah, there are the legal aspects, court decisions, double tax treaties, but there's also technology and the administrative effort of, of tax reclaims um, that make it a very complex issue for us. Ms. Pusila, what's the future of withholding tax in Europe? <laughs> um, well, well, I would need an hour to go through that. But um, um, I guess I would like to say that I hope we don't get stuck on the very complex issues. I think we need a roadmap and start resolving the issues one by one and going one step uh, at, at a time towards the common goal. Because I, I, what, what we've seen in the past is that uh, once we start discussing uh, about uh, uh, transparent funds, etc., and very these like complex and very difficult questions, uh, also from the technical perspective, but also from the legal perspective, it also the, all the improvement kind of like uh, stops. It, it's standing still. I hope we can go towards uh, resolving uh, smaller issues. And, and kind of like slowly going towards the common goal and not get stuck by the fact that there are very difficult issues that are more difficult to resolve. I think that's my final statement. Yeah. And maybe the EU Commission finds time besides some other problems that they have. Mr. Goeb, before Mr. Zielmeier ends our, uh, our discussion, Mr. Goeb, what, what is your thought on the, on the uh, uh, withholding checks across Europe in the future? Yeah, um, I think we all agree that it is a, a field where uh, a lot of there's a lot of room for enhancement, room for automation, room for a more free flow of, of capital. Uh, probably we we see the withholding process as one of the major obstacles here. There's probably another one. I don't know if it is tackled in another session. That's the question of uh, uh, the entitlement uh, um, handling around dividend payment time. Uh, this, I think, is a problem that needs to be solved, not in the process of tax withholding, but in the process of settlement. 
Uh, so most of the problems stem from different settlement cycles, late settlements, etc., and the existence of settlement cycles at all. If we could get this on a straight field, and the European Union has done a lot of work on this, if we can get that straight, and if we can get that consistent, we would not have these issues there, and we would not be discussing cumex and all that stuff. Yeah. So that's Thank my you. point of view. That's something where we can still, we will still have some years of work in front of us to remove this or that barrier from the community. Thank you very much, Mr. Siedlmeier. I have two dreams. The one, at least the member states or the G20 in the OECD, they, let's say, uh, regard investment fund as treaty entitled as such, or uh, the other way is that those uh, South countries act like Germany in a way that they limit the withholding tax to foreign funds to 15%. And then I think most of the issues would be solved. Okay. Okay, thank you very much to the audience. A bit of uh, overtime, two minutes. Uh, thank you very much for joining our discussion. And thank you very much, Ms. Natistov, Ms. Pusila, Mr. Grip, and Mr. Zinomayer, for joining our discussion. Thank you very much. Welcome to the state of the future. We will soon start at 100 million securities and derivative transactions a year, navigating millions of legal and technical requirements through years of experience and vast amounts of data. We arrive at software solutions and services at highest quality levels, exceeding the industry standard by a factor of five, all to finally zero in on a single personal customer need, yours. Finding the hole in the detail and vice versa. This way we create the state of the future setting digital standards for years to come.